Yeah, so um, I also want to, uh, to thank the Academy, <laughs> David, <laughs> for inviting me uh, to participate in this. Um, and um, so my, um, my uh, interest is mostly on, um, on the host side, on the side of uh, particularly uh, on the side of the um, aspects of the immune system and its role in uh, host protection. Um, and uh, so my few remarks would be uh, sort of centered from that direction. Um, as it happens in the development of many fields, if we look at the history of discoveries and then once the field is matured and we use these discoveries to, let's say, to teach the students, the order in which you would present the knowledge often doesn't match with the order in which the discoveries are made. And uh, often something that for various historical reasons was discovered first is actually an outlier of some more general phenomenon that may be discovered later. So I think in the, in the field of uh, immunology and uh, microbial, microbiota biology, we are sort of in that state now where we don't have the full picture yet, but we now, I think, many start feeling that we uh, got our knowledge in the, again, in the wrong direction, uh, such that what we based our understanding of the immune system is now needs to be in many ways uh, um, revised, particularly aspects that have to do with the role immune system in protection from infections and the whole notion of infection versus colonization and pathogens versus non-pathogens and so on. So the, uh, of course, historically, as we've already heard, uh, when uh, in the, uh, about 100 years ago when the germ theory was developed, uh, that was an incredible uh, uh, breakthrough in uh, uh, mentality in understanding diseases. It replaced something that was uh, called miasma theory, which was basically uh, explaining every disease by something being in the air, uh, in the foul air. And uh, so with the advent of the germ theory, uh, uh, the reason Koch postulates exist uh, was that there was, a, there was a need for a system that would provide a very strict evidence uh, based on very rigorous uh, uh, criteria demonstrating causal connections between specific uh, pathogens and specific diseases. And uh, of course, most of the knowledge about our interactions with microbes uh, over the past uh, 100 years was based on analysis of the interaction of the immune system with various pathogens. And the idea, uh, therefore, developed uh, around this notion that we evolved mechanisms to detect pathogens and destroy them. And as uh, David already alluded uh, earlier uh, this morning, uh, many of these views are uh, um, uh, probably not applicable in more general sense in the way we interact with microbes, that it's uh, less of a warfare and more of an um, uh, activity of park, park rangers. It's more about management rather than uh, uh, antagonism. And the problem is that, uh, that we're now all facing is that uh, we don't really know uh, the rules of uh, management. We know that there are some bacteria better than others. Our definitions of good and bad are in many ways arbitrary or conditional uh, on some factors that uh, we don't know uh, all of the factors that are relevant. Um, and the what we call pathogens in many ways is really our outliers in this complex interactions between hosts and microbes. And that uh, calls for sort of reconceptualization of how we think about the immune, interaction, immune system interaction with microbes uh, as uh, uh, we now don't have a really as clear understanding as we thought we had about 10, 10 years ago. Uh, that we, we, are not, we don't really have a good understanding of how the immune system deter makes the determination of what is considered a beneficial and what's considered detrimental microbe. Because 
as far as what we know about the immune system detection of microbes, it's based on criteria that don't discriminate between microbial behavior necessarily. And uh, the determination that needs to be made to perform the kind of management functions that David mentioned would require that the immune system has an information about the intentions or behaviors or some other aspects of microbial biology. And what this is is uh, generally uh, unclear. There are some, except for trivial cases when microbes, for example, are invasive and uh, they trespass and then you can detect that. But, uh, but the idea then arises that maybe it will change in many ways uh, the way we think about infectious diseases and host microbe interactions is that there are some aspects of microbial biology that are relevant for, for the host uh, are detected and interpreted. This could include, for example, microbial metabolites. This could include various types of signals that microbes generate as a function of their uh, place in microbial communities. And, and, and this is somehow through evolutionary time has been uh, hardwired into the, our immune system to detect as an indication of uh, the um, intentions of these microbes. And uh, just one last point is that uh, defense systems like an immune system, uh, they can provide uh, huge benefits in the face of uh, infections or in, fact, in, in face of other challenges. And because of these big benefits, they, uh, they can come with high costs. And these cost-benefit ratios are generally adjusted to a particular type of environment. And as uh, already mentioned here, and, and Justin brought it up earlier, that uh, change in the environment can uh, have various impacts that are unpredictable, often detrimental. But for systems that have high cost, high benefit, changes in the environment are can be particularly devastating because the benefits that the systems provided may no longer be there, but we still remain uh, with the costs. And this is, again, uh, an issue of uh, management and how that management can be derailed by uh, changing cost-benefit structure. Great, thank you.